Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are still on our journey through the Gospels. This is Gospels Part 79. Last week we saw Jesus expound on concept of prayer, um, and he used a couple different examples. The first was a, a friend going to another friend in the middle of the night and asking him for resources because he was trying to offer hospitality to this person that arrived unexpectedly, and the the friend at the house who woke up at a certain point, reluctantly gave in after the persistence of his friend to, to give him what he needed. And Jesus was showing this contrast to, to expound on if you have people in your life who are reluctantly giving uh, what you need, like how much more so that Colva Comer is God, uh, the Father, Jesus, the Son, the Spirit, going to provide and meet you when you come to him with similar lo- requests in your life and your journey. Um, yeah. And then it's interesting, though, because he talks about seeking and knocking um, and the door being opened. And we kind of looked at the specifics of that. Like maybe Jesus was not meaning, like, come to him with any sort of request you want and he will grant it. But, like, if you're seeking after God and his kingdom and his characteristics, that those things are what will be granted to you if you are pursuing them. Um, and then we left off with another example of the father and the son analogy where um, talking about if if a, if a father, if a son asked a father for something and he gave him something completely different, whether it's like a piece of bread was what was asked and the, the father gave him a stone uh, or scorpion yeah. uh, <laughs> and Jesus is saying like, how much more is your heavenly father going to give you and we we didn't expect that Jesus says he's going to give you the spirit. Uh, and we kind of left off with like, why is it of all things that Jesus mentioned that that's what he's focusing on is how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And then we had that Pentecost analogy connection at the end. Yeah, that was a good episode. Okay, so people out in podcast land, you have no way of knowing this. We... Uh, each of us, everything that we do in life, we probably have some sort of approach, some sort of ritual, maybe, depending on the type of personality you are and all that. I am so outside my bubble right now. It is a mess. So I just listened to Samuel do a quick review of what happened last time, and it sounded so interesting because I have done zero preparation for today. <laughs> so it's like, this oh, that was great. I want to go listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> because I hadn't I hadn't read anything. So if I sound lost or weird or something today, it's because I got no prep time. Obviously, I did all the study at some point, but that happened, you know, back in history somewhere, and I'm, you know, trying to redo it now. So this is going to be fun. Let's have at it, Samuel. It's going to show the spirit at work. That's right. Now, here's the thing. Everything that you just talked about seemingly has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. So. Let's just get into it. We start in, uh, let's see, this is Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. It says this, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Samuel, I'm not going to ask if anybody in your family has ever thought that or said that about you. I'm also not going to volunteer any information about me. <laughs> but what's going on here? Let's just little bis, little uh, piece parts here. Uh, first, it says that he went home. Well, Samuel, what are the possibilities there? Um, and let's just be clear. I'm pretty sure that he in, is Jesus. So let's lay that yeah. out <laughs> as yeah. an anchor. Yeah. Well, where where's home? Well, he's definitely not Jerusalem because that's where he just was visiting. Right. And now, where was he, uh, like, where did, did he grow up? 
um, was it Nazareth? Yeah. G- Galilee? Nazareth. Yeah. And, and I mean, hey, in verse 21, it starts talking about his family. Do you think maybe it was back there? Or, but then, remember when he went to, Ga- to Nazareth, was he very popular? <laughs> no, they no. did not like him. Yeah. That didn't work out very well. So, we kind of have to go back, though it's not explicit. It just says home, and I think it's probably most reasonable for us to think, you know what, he's gone back to Peter's house. That kind of became his home away from home. And so, if, if we were to, you know, look at all the scholars, that's probably the most popular uh, assumption that you're going to find in all of that. Makes sense to me. I think it's the best. And so, that puts our minds back in Capernaum, kind of like his real stomping grounds. This is the most popular place we see in all of the Gospels for Jesus doing work. So anyway, we think we're back in Capernaum then, and now uh, it says a crowd gathers. So we got a house filled with people, and it says that it's so packed, they can't even prepare any food. Now, again. I don't know that we've heard the phrase, they couldn't prepare any food, but this whole idea of them being at Peter's house and it just being completely packed, big crowds overflowing outside, is this familiar, Samuel? Yeah, I feel like we've seen this several times. Yeah, and in a way, this is almost comfortable because it's like, man, we've been going through all this stuff and all this tension back in you know, Jerusalem and the holiday and all these different things. Okay, we're back in Capernaum. It's a familiar place. We got crowds. This is all good. This is good. Except that's all they give us. They got this crowd, and then it starts talking about his family. And we get this little bit where I don't know. They they they've heard something about him. It says, and when his family heard it. And so the question is, well, what did they hear? Did they hear that he was back home? Did they hear that a crowd gathered? Did they hear that they couldn't even eat? I mean, none of those things seem like the kind of thing that the family would, I mean, we have to assume they they went out, they made a trip to him to seize him because he's out of his mind. I mean, is there any, <laughs> is there anything about going to Peter's house or having a crowd or not getting to, I mean, that doesn't fit, does it? It seems out of place. Yeah. So whatever it is, there's something that's happened that makes them think he's out of his mind. Well, let's do this. Because we've been jumping around in the Gospels, right? Remember, we're trying to go through the Gospels in time order so that we're not doing the story. It, make, it doesn't feel like we're doing it four times through. We're doing it one time through. Well, what happens is we kind of lose track of what each individual author, author might be saying at any particular point in time. So if we back up just a little bit in Mark's gospel, what we're going to see is that Jesus has just named the 12 apostles. And so now you bring this into the story and you go, wait a second. This is just the oldest brother. This is the guy who prior to a couple of years ago, he was just, you know, doing work like a carpenter kind of work. He was taking care of the family. He was doing this stuff. And now all of a sudden he's off and he's he's running around with these guys. He's doing these teaching and he isn't just doing that. He's actually taking his place as an actual rabbi with disciples and sending them out among like the the nation, all of us. So I don't know that that's what got them kind of upset or or out of out of uh, kilter, but something has upset them. Something is making them think he's out of their mind. And since we're in Mark, and since that's the most recent thing that is actually really notable, I'm just kind of throwing out there, that must have been it. They must have heard about this whole, he's taken on, you know, official disciples and he's sending them out and all this kind of stuff. So it's like, 
because he's doing these things, he's also, now, I, I don't know, this this sort of makes it feel like it's out of time and everything that we've been going through, but you got to know he's he's stirring up these big crowds and everybody knows that causing a ruckus, stirring up a crowd, doing all these things, it's going to get you in trouble one way or another. It's either going to be with the religious leaders or it's going to be with the Romans. Somehow it's trouble. And so in some way, man, that he's, you know, he's bringing on these, these disciples. He's naming apostles. He's sending them out on missions, doing what he's doing. He's got these big crowds being stirred up. This is all just trouble, trouble, trouble. He kind of put all those things together and maybe it isn't so crazy to think that his family was thinking that he was a little bit crazy. But I don't know. It's really just a guess. But still, think of it. His family kind of thinking he's crazy. These crowds, though, they just think he's awesome. They just, they 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 love it. <laughs> you know, he's Messiah. So, so, so true to life. If you've ever been a part of a big family, I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. Sounds like the drama is intensifying as we go into the next section. Well, maybe. And then, you know, as we've seen before, sometimes it just seems like we bounce back and forth. All kinds of weird stuff. So, I don't know. Let's see what's going on. This next section, we're finally getting back into something where we've got multiple books telling the same story. So, let's see. This covers Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 28. Also, Mark chapter 3, verses 22 to through 26, and then Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 20. And I think we're going to read from Matthew. Yeah, let's see what we got. Uh, We got an extra little bit here over in Luke that we'll add, but otherwise, let's do Matthew. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay. Almost sounds like comprehensible logic in there somewhere, right, Samuel? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good thing. We don't always get that. Uh, I want to read the last verse of the Luke section because he says the same thing, but a slightly different way. It's very interesting. In verse 20, he says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So Luke uses that phrase finger of God. So we'll talk about that. It's really good. But I just want to take a second, okay? Now we had... You know, hey, there's a crowd and his family thinks he's crazy. And then Jesus starts casting out a demon. And so I've got this question, Samuel. Do you think when his family came to seize him, did they get to see this? I kind of hope they did. Yeah. And did they still think he was crazy? Right. I mean, (laughs) it's got to mess with them a little bit, right? We do know that later... His family, at least portion of his family, we don't know about every single member, but they did. They they became true, true believers. But what about this moment right here? Did they get to see that? I, I don't know. It's interesting. I hope they did. But anyway, 
The basic setup, this is actually kind of familiar. We've seen this, I think, in a few stories beforehand. Uh, you got a demon-possessed guy. In this case, he's deaf and mute. And Jesus heals him. Okay, not so unexpected anymore. It's it's becoming, yeah, yeah, Jesus does this stuff. And the crowd marvels. Also, okay, that's kind of standard fare. Now, some are, you know, they're wondering, they're questioning, they're thinking he may be the Messiah. They're calling him the son of David. And that's, that is what that phrase means to them. And Luke, uh, we didn't read that out loud, but he also adds, it kind of seems like some of them are actually, you know, they're, they're egging him on. Hey, you know what? You, it's kind of seems like you're the Messiah. So, you know, do more Messiah stuff, you know, show us. It's great. And again, this is all just familiar. And then you've got Pharisees or maybe scribes and Pharisees or whatever. Depends on what version you're reading, what, what, uh, what book. And the point about them, again, not a surprise. Okay. So they're not marveling. In fact, they're kind of, I don't know, in some way bothered or offended or put off by all of this, but they do something new. They do something we have not seen before. This time they start telling people, and it's also very interesting that it, in the text, it says that they said, so it, they said it out loud. They start telling people that Jesus's power and authority, the thing that they're seeing him do, it's not from God but it's from Beelzebul, the prince of demons. That seems kind of crazy. Uh, just just off the top of my head. That, that, these guys are, they're offended. They're mad. They're bothered because now they've pulled crazy out of their back pocket and they're just passing it out like candy. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They're just, I, that's, a, that's an intense thing to say. And then also super weird. We're told that Jesus knows their thoughts. Well, it seems like they said this part out loud. Samuel, what do you think their thoughts were? (laughs) I mean, similar. (laughs) Well, yeah, probably. They probably have to be similar, but I don't know. They, They went somewhere, something different. It's just, it's so interesting to see little things like that in the text because... Jesus, it's it's almost as if, the way it's written, it's almost as if what they said might not have been enough to make him say whatever Jesus was about to say, but because he knew their thoughts, it sort of pushed him over the edge, right? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, it's kind of familiar. We've seen Jesus do this. He kind of seems to know things, even when things aren't said out loud, whatever. But I don't know. It's just interesting. Maybe it means nothing. Maybe it's just a slip of the pen and it just, there's nothing even there, but it's just fun to imagine. Anyway, he hits them with something that, I don't know, they kind of seem like parables. Some people call them parables. Other people don't. Uh, they're just sort of Jesus speaking logically or whatever. You can take it any way you want. We're not going to bother with it too much. You know that our stance is that the parables, and it, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent, but very, very uh, often, most of the time, substantial amount of time, parables are about the kingdom. Well, it just so happens that in this case, Jesus is referencing something about a kingdom. So you got that. Uh, But his point is this, any house or any kingdom or any palace, whatever you want to fill in there, that is divided has a very predictable end. It is will fall. Now, if only all of America would read their Bible and actually believe it, Mm. that'd be a nice, nice warning, wouldn't it? Hey, if you're divided, this isn't going to end well. But anyway, side note, we don't do politics here. So if anything, house, palace, kingdom, if it's, if it's divided, it's gonna fall. And I would think If anybody knew anything about humans, knew anything about history, this should be, you know, one of those things you can't really argue. It's it's true. It's just true. It's a general truth. History, plenty of proof. But Jesus starts getting specific. And now they said, remember the name they used, Samuel? Uh, Beelzebub. Yeah, weird name. But Jesus doesn't use that name. As he responds to them, he starts talking about Satan. 
And this is interesting because, I mean, okay, so it should, I guess, in our minds, raise a question. So so are we saying that Beelzebul is Satan? They're the same person, the same entity, whatever. And the thing is, the reason that's interesting is because at this time, this was a, a pretty common thing that, that they were equating Satan with Beelzebul. However, you could also read it that there is this Beelzebul, and he isn't exactly Satan. He's actually someone who is under Satan's authority, and that Jesus doesn't want to deal with the lower authority type entity. He's going straight to the top of the hierarchy. They brought up Beelzebul, and Jesus raises the stakes and just starts talking about Satan himself. Now, this is also possible, and the reason I bring it up is because also in Jesus' day, there were those who believed, uh, you know, interesting things about this Beelzebul character, and one of them was that he was one of the troublemakers from back in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We don't have to spend time talking about it. It's an interesting thing you can go read, but that would sort of agree with the idea that this Beelzebul wasn't Satan, but Jesus was just skipping him and going right to the top. Okay, we don't know which is right. I mean, you know, we don't have insight into the spiritual realm like that, but it's interesting. Either way, Jesus is not backing down. He's going, he's, you know, he's standing right up to the powers that be, which is no big surprise at this point. Plenty of argument on both sides of that one. Uh, it doesn't really affect Jesus's point. Um, we're just being curious, and when we do stuff like it, you know, don't let it distract you. It's just fun, interesting information, it's making the story a little richer. But anyway, let's get back to the point. Jesus takes this general truth about, you know, a house divided will fall, and he declares that this same thing that's true for whatever we might see in normal everyday life, well, it's also true for Satan and his kingdom. It's no different. And so, if that is true, then it's like this inferred question, and Samuel, you can answer it out loud. How stupid would it be for Satan to be dividing his own kingdom, casting out his own uh, minions, soldiers, whatever you want to call them? As Forrest Gump says, stupid is as stupid does. (laughs) There you go. it It would just be stupid. And so, following the inference... What is he saying about the scribes and Pharisees? That their logic is stupid. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. He's pretty much just going, you're dumb. That's at least how we'd say it in Kentucky, right? (laughs) You're dumb. So they, and, and I actually, I think this is a really good insight into humanity, human thinking, egos, all that kind of stuff. They're just really irritated. They are just really bothered by this guy. And Samuel, what do humans do when we get really irritated and really bothered? We say... (laughs) Dumb stuff. (laughs) That's right. We just say stupid stuff. So that's that's what they're doing here. So you can have any opinion you want about the scribes and Pharisees, whatever. Just don't be... Don't be too quick to judge, because after all, they're human and you're human, and you know what? We can be dumb sometimes. And I just want to say it out loud again. How many of the scribes and Pharisees, Samuel? Is it all of them? No, some of them. Yeah. Whenever you're reading this stuff, you just got to remember it's just some of them. So anyway, Jesus, he really gets them. He reminds them. This is so good. The way he says it is, he reminds them that their, their sons also cast out demons. Now, when they say that, could it be that they're, it's their literal offspring, right? That's my boy. Uh, okay, maybe. It could be. But it's actually more likely, because these are religious leaders and they're supposed to be all learned and smart, you know, all this kind of, it's probably their disciples, which would also mean that they probably learned it from them, whatever. So he reminds them that their sons, their disciples probably, also cast out demons, which might even lead you to believe that these very scribes and Pharisees standing before them, they, in fact, may have, at some point, 
also cast out demons themselves, even though Jesus didn't say it that way. So, since their sons cast out demons also, well, then they're going to make great judges. And how is it that they're going to be great judges? Well, they are going to actually be able to look at this situation and go, wait a second, you guys, you scribes and Pharisees, you're showing partiality, which in Jewish culture and in, you know, Israel, God, all this kind that's a big no-no. Showing partiality is a bad thing. And they're going to see that. They're going to go, you guys are ascribing evil in one case and goodness in another case, and the two cases are exactly the same. This is wrong. It, today, we'd call that you're being a hypocrite, right? It was a little different for them. They use that for the show off. But it's the, so their, their own sons, their own disciples are going to be able to judge them and show that they're, they're being stupid because they're ascribing evil in one case, good in another case, and it's the exact same case. So Jesus finishes the argument with, since, you know, if we're being honest here, it's the Spirit of God that is at work. Then you can see the only relevant kingdom that's really involved in this conversation here is the kingdom of God. If it's the Spirit of God that's doing the work, then what are we talking about potentially dividing or, or you know, ter- whatever? It's the kingdom of God. So we know it's not divided. We know that it is united. And at Jesus' point is this kingdom, this kingdom of God, it has come upon you through Jesus. Just as it has, and this is my opinion, uh, through others all across Israel's history. The kingdom of God is, is coming upon them. And so that's all Jesus is saying to these scribes and Pharisees. You, you are talking about the wrong kingdom. It's the kingdom of God, and it's upon you, and you're not even seeing it. In fact, you're actually saying that it's not even the Spirit. You're saying that it's Satan himself. So, super bad. Now, there's another thing. Remember I read that part from Luke about the finger of God? Mm-hmm. Well, this is, this is really good. We see this show up in our Old Testament scriptures in a few different places. So let's see if we can recall these, Samuel. So back, uh, remember when God, he was trying to pull uh, Israel out of Egypt. And when he did that, he launched the, the 10 plagues against Egypt. And I don't know if you remember this, uh, at, at, at the beginning, there were some, they called them magicians, who were trying to imitate the things that Moses was doing. And then it got to a point where they couldn't imitate it anymore. And when they couldn't do that, this is back in Exodus chapter 8, verse 19, the magicians themselves, they were looking at this and they were going, okay, this is out of our hands. It, we can't do this stuff. It has to be, do you remember, Samuel? Do they say the finger of God? Oh, yeah. Dang. Yeah. Yeah, I should have, I should have put this in my notes so we could read it out loud. You can go search for it if you want. And then there's another one. He goes, remember the two tablets at Sinai? Mm-hmm. Do you remember how they were written? I just, I'm drawing a blank here. It's by the finger of God. What, that, that phrase is used in, in the text in Exodus as well. You know what? We may have to break from the notes and you have to go look this stuff up. <laughs> go to Exodus okay. eight nineteen. Do it. And this, the Exodus eight nineteen is the one about Egypt. So we'll read that first. Exodus 8.19 says, Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. <laughs> wow. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And now go to Exodus 31.18. Exodus 31.18. And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, and there's another reference. We don't have to go read it. Deuteronomy 9, verse 10. There's that as well. It's so interesting that Luke brings that into this little narrative uh, because he had just done this miraculous healing of the blind mute guy. You know, is that what it was? No, deaf mute. Uh, whoever he was, he, he healed him. And, and, and so in a way, notice that when we're talking about the finger of God, this was the plagues, this was the tablets. There's this real tight connection with Moses. And who is Moses? He's the first redeemer. Jesus is the final redeemer, or second redeemer, however you say that. So just as Moses was initially being accused of using magic, which, you know, where was magic supposedly from, Samuel? Satan, demons, uh, etc. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So he's, Moses is initially accused and Moses is ultimately shown to have, have had God with him, working through him. Jesus gets accused in a similar kind of manner, except it's not, you know, it's not magic. It's just, you know, actual demon, Beelzebul. And, uh, but Jesus is also ultimately going to be endorsed and validated, verified by God. But of course, we don't see that here. It comes most spectacularly in his resurrection. But that Luke slipping in that one little phrase is just, oh, that's power. That's neat. So had to point that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that finger of God connection is super cool. Um, I did want to, it's mostly a comment. I guess whenever I've read this passage in the past with how the Pharisees came to Jesus in this situation. I've always just struggled to try to get my head in where their headspace was because I know in previous examples when the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus about things, it's often because of some type of misconception that their oral traditions on how they are trying to interpret the law concerning things like the Sabbath and you know, dietary and cleanliness laws, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so I, I can empathize. It's like they're struggling because the the culture and the context around them has gotten them confused on what the original intention of what the law meant for humanity uh, sure. in Israel. But in this case, it just seems completely unfounded, like out of left field. Like I wonder if it's if they're getting more and more frustrated with Jesus continually like having success and doing these things to showcase the kingdom and they're kind of grasping at straws and that's why they say something as ridiculous as this it's just it's really unlike their character knowing like how well they know the text um how intelligent of a sect of Judaism they are I just I, I wrestle with that. Yeah. Well, and it's because it's irrational. You're saying, yeah, so many times I see them, you know, looking at the text or, you know, mis misinterpretation or different, whatever. And that's because that all feels very rational. Well, they were just missing it. You know, something took them off the, the, the path a little bit or something. This is just irrational. And that's kind of sort of what I was getting at with the fact that they were irritated, they were bothered, they said stupid things, whatever. When people get offended, they stop seeing clearly. They stop being rational. And that, I think what you're saying, they just got so frustrated or, you know, what this guy keeps, you know, quote unquote, winning, <laughs> whatever. It's, it's true. And, and the, I mean, honestly, it, we just had that thing where his family thought that Jesus was crazy, and now we get the, it's the scribes and Pharisees. It's like, you know what? They're actually starting to act a little bit crazy. Mm. They're just, they're, they're out of there. So, yeah, it's, it's a good point, Samuel. They're just, they're gone. And it's good for us, just as humans in general, when you find yourself looking at a situation and well, it's so hard when you're in it. I, I, I just, I have to be fair to me and everyone else. <laughs> when you get in this place, it's really hard to even see and know that you're in it. But humans do it. And I'm just guessing I've done it. You've done it. Everybody listening has done it. You get so offended that 
everything is colored by some lens every you know like we talk about rose colored glasses i don't know these would be like brown colored glasses or something i don't know what it is but it's bad you just you're not even seeing clearly anymore and you're responding emotionally with words actions everything you're just you're just out in left field and the people that are seeing it and experiencing it it is super easy for them to see and you just look like a crazy person just like they did So it's good. Just don't judge them too harshly because you're human too. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, going on, uh, let's see. The next section, we're looking at Matthew chapter 12, verses 29 and 30, Mark chapter 3, verse 27, and Luke chapter 11, verses 21 through 23. And you know what? Since Luke brought out the whole finger of God thing, we're going to read from him now. Just he, It's like he won the lottery. Yeah. Here we go. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Okay. Now, I'm sure you remember at some point we've talked about the whole, you know, uh, who's with me or against me or whatever. So that's always interesting because it seems like Jesus says it both ways. But anyway, uh, here we have, uh, let's just call it another parable, a parable of the strong man. And now, interestingly, though, If you were to read a bunch of different commentary, scholars, this, that, whatever, buddy, there is, there is a veritable smorgasbord of who is the strong man and who is this and who's that. It's, I was actually kind of surprised, but here's what we're going to go with. We're going to go with a strong man and we're going to say that that is Satan because we've just come out of, you know, Jesus is talking about plundering his kingdom right? That kind of thing. So we have a strong man, Satan, and it says that he's fully armed. And that sounds easy, but I want to say this out loud because I think it's important. That means he has both offensive weapons and defensive weapons. He is fully armed. He has armor with which to fight and armor that he might wear with which he's defended, that kind of thing. And he's guarding his own place and he's guarding his own goods. But Jesus's point is this. If someone stronger than this guy attacks him, well, he's going to lose. I mean, you you are, if you're in a, on a scale of one to 10, if your strength is only a seven and an eight comes along, I don't know what to tell you. You're going to lose that battle. So in the context of casting out demons, the stronger man who's going to do the attacking, well, that's Jesus. And, and let's, we could also say it's the Spirit of God working through Jesus. It's the finger of God. And even in this, we can still kind of see a connection back to Moses because what did Moses do? Moses went to Egypt and, you know... Uh, mighty, mighty nation in that day and time, possibly the mightiest nation of that time. And Moses plunders the strong man. And so as we've seen the connection to Moses a little earlier, it's continuing. But I want to notice, I want all of us to notice some of the details about the victory. First, uh, he overcomes him. He conquers him. He prevails. All right. That's a, that's a thing, seems obvious, but when he does that, he takes away his armor, and that's going back to the fact that he was fully armed, so when he takes away his armor, he's, he's taking away both his offensive weapons and his defensive weapons, and, and why does he do that? Why? That's a good question, Samuel. Why, when he takes him over, why would he take away all of his armor, offensive and defensive? I mean, it believe you leaves the enemy completely powerless exactly the the things 
that he even used to build up his house, to, to fill his house or his palace or his kingdom or whatever. It was this armor. The stronger he got, the more he was able to accumulate. And so he takes it away so that he doesn't have the a power or the ability to do that again. He's left impotent to regain anything that he had. So that's a cool picture, especially if we're thinking about Jesus taken away from Satan. And if that wasn't enough, uh, then this stronger man, Jesus, he divides the spoils with those who are on his team, which I, I, th- that's a little weird because, okay, it, just in the, the the natural sense, you think, okay, so the things that have been taken, the things that have been stolen from mankind or creation or, you know, God's intention in Eden, you know, all, however it is you might imagine that, those are the things that have been stolen, taken away, and and so he's going to divide that with, and I would say those on his team, that would be, you know, us, believers, those who are the true, faithful, and loyal. And and so that all makes sense. And, and it, it reminds us, I think, uh, yet again, it's another connection with Moses. Egypt was completely stripped of her power, both when they're leaving all of the 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 spoils, the 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 riches, you know, they they took a bunch of stuff with them, but they also all of uh, Pharaoh. I'm assuming Pharaoh himself, his entire army, they were all drowned in the sea. Maybe Pharaoh survived it. It's it's uh, debatable, but all of those were taken. So it's just like Moses. Uh, but you could also so that's if we look at the spoils as you know things taken from mankind, creation, Eden, whatever. But you could also say that. In some way, people themselves, they are the spoil, which is a super cool picture. I just don't know how that fits in with the idea of him, you know, dividing the spoils with the people on his team. It kind of gets a little weird there, but both are very interesting pictures. And then he, you know, he talks about the scattering. You know, if you scatter with me, uh, uh, if you're not with me, you're against me. Whoever doesn't gather with me scatters. So it'd be understandable to sort of get the image in your head of like grain and agriculture. And, I, you know, I'm not saying that that's wrong or bad or anything, but I think it's probably a little more appropriate in this case if we think in terms of sheep or flocks. So when we're talking about gathering and scattering, we might imagine, let's just say sheep. Uh, that's a better picture. Uh, and of course, that relates to the big picture. God's gathering his people that have been scattered. And that fits with the whole context of everything we're talking about. Jesus, I mean, in some sense, he's making a very simple but powerful appeal. There are only two sides. You got those who are with Jesus, God, etc. And then you have those who are not. You're either participating in taking back what has been stolen, or you're aiding in the theft and the plunder of mankind, etc. And I don't know, when when you make it simple like that, then you also have to say, all right, so sadly, there are many who are convinced that they are on God's team, but they might be surprised. And and if you need any evidence of that, I'm going to, I'm just going to throw some verses out. You could go read Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, or Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Or Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Now, it's not my place, it's not Samuel's place, it's not our place, it's not anybody's place to judge one another's final destiny. That's all in God's hands. However, at the very least, we should be quick to examine ourselves. And we need to examine ourselves carefully, very closely, to see if we are truly on his team. Are we gatherers and not scatterers? And I know immediately everybody's thinking to themselves, well, of course, I'm a gatherer. I'm not a scatterer. But are you really? Go read those and see what you think. This is, it's it's a self-examination moment and it's good. And it's important because what are we talking about, Samuel? This is life or death here. Mm. This is a big deal. And so, I just, you know, I saw the thing about scattering and gathering. It's like, you know what? Make sure you're on the team. Don't assume. Really examine yourself. It's important. Yeah. 
It's well said. It's convicting. Well, it is at least that. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So, anything else, Samuel, or do I go on? I think we press on. All right. Well, this is a... Boy, this is a good one. This is definitely going to take us to the end of the episode. Let's just hope it's not like two hours long. (laughs) So, here we go. Uh, We're going to read. This is section uh, Matthew 12, verses 31 to 32. Mark chapter 3, verses 28 to 30, and Luke chapter 12, verse 10. I'm going to read from Matthew because it's got the most detail, so here we go. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Samuel, would you like to gulp loudly in the microphone? (laughs) Gulp. I mean, come on. This has everybody who's ever read these verses shaken in their boots a little bit, right? It's one of those verses that always scares people. And, I mean, you know, in some sense, this is good. We need to, we need to definitely, I mean, we just talked about how people, we got to examine ourselves, right? We always need a healthy dose of reverential fear kind of mixed into our relationship with God. In some sense, and there are times, it's, it's, It's so appropriate to be uh, relating to God as uh, like Father, Abba. I mean, you. Some people I've heard them. They talk about that image where it's just like climbing up. I was a kid climbing up into my dad's lap. You know what? Sometimes that's an appropriate way to look at God, but sometimes we need we need reverential fear. You can't you can't just have one without the other. He is a holy God. So. Here's one of those instances. Wow, blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. What does that mean? First of all, let's pay close attention to how he started. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Okay, let's just take that much of it and and at least rest in the goodness of that. There's pretty much nothing that you could say or do in your entire life and let's just say it this way, that isn't eligible for forgiveness. I mean, and the reason I, I want to focus on this is because so many people just somehow don't seem to get this. I mean, if, if you just stop for a second and take it in, we have a patient and merciful and loving and forgiving God. But a lot of people, they just don't get it. When, when he says this, he means you. Now, I don't even know who I'm talking about. I'm just saying you, singular, to anybody who might be listening. You are not unlovable or unforgivable. This is just one of those things about God. But a lot of people live with, well, yeah, he, he's a loving God, but he can't forgive me. He, not for what I've done. And this, just this much of it, it should be absolutely heartbreaking to every one of us in like the good way. It should break our heart knowing that there's a God that loves humanity that much. Now, having said that, and I'm not trying to ruin our little love fest or anything, but it does require turning to him. Okay? When you, and let's just, I don't know, let's say you're Jeffrey Dahmer and you're like, you know, fixing a a roast dinner out of the guy you just killed a week ago, okay? Is God loving that about you. Okay, no. God hates murder. He hates, you know, all of these things. Okay, so you do have to turn to him in repentance, in faithfulness. And and it doesn't even mean that you you always have to it's not like God could never forgive anything because you you didn't repent properly or something. I mean, sometimes we just do things completely in ignorance. So there's that. But I'm just saying, 
God doesn't just love every human unconditionally at all times, as in like universalism. There are some people who are not going to get eternity with him because they're, quote unquote, not on his team. And we have to recognize that. So there's just when you turn to him, when you repent, when you begin to live in faithfulness and loyalty toward him, understand that everything in your past is forgivable. Except that Jesus adds to the sentence. It's like, oh, but wait, there is some bad news. Apparently there is something. There is at least one thing for which there is apparently no forgiveness. Now, as it's written right here in the context, it comes across like this. You cannot knowingly speak ill of the Holy Spirit. Another way to say that is you cannot knowingly attribute the manifest works of God accomplished through the Spirit to something other than God, something other than the Spirit, like in this case, attributing it to Satan. You can't call the completely pure impure. You can't call the completely clean unclean. Now, apparently, you could even do any and all of this stuff to Jesus himself and still escape, escape judgment. But, but if you do it with the Holy Spirit, okay, that's a line. You, you should not cross. And if you do, there's no coming back. Kind of crazy, right? And so what's everybody thinking to themselves right now, Samuel? That's a good question. I, I mean, that's a very specific thing that Jesus is referencing. So maybe it's alleviating some people's fears about this passage. I hope that it is. But you know that there are people out there, maybe even listening to the podcast, who are going, did I ever do that? Did I? I mean, what if I did and I didn't know? That's what goes through people's heads. Now, you got to understand, we're just guys, we're just people, and we're, we're trying to understand, we're trying to understand God and all this, but here we go. First of all, this idea of being unforgivable. Number one, some argue that, well, all it means is that you won't be forgiven without repentance. So what they're saying is, well, no, it is unforgivable, uh, but you could still repent from it, and then all of a sudden, it's forgivable again. God would do that. So they're they're reading the statement as hyperbole. Now, Samuel, have we ever seen hyperbole in our study so far? Uh, once or twice. <laughs> yeah, it's a real thing. So, okay, maybe, maybe these guys have a point. Maybe there's just hyperbole going on here. They're kind of uh, well, the hyperbole, what's the point of the hyperbole? It's to, to highlight the, the grave nature of what is being done. And, you know, that's a good thing. But if it is hyperbole, it's not actually drawing an uncrossable line. Now, you know, I, I'm, I'm admitting that this is possible. It would depend upon a merciful God. Samuel, do we have one of those? I think so. We do. So that is a possibility. Now, there are others. They're going to argue that, uh, no, uh, no, the way this is worded and whatever. No, there is no such thing as repentance in this case. It's kind of like you can't unring the bell. Now, I think that this is also possible. And in this case, I think it would, it would be necessary. And this is, this is the important part. It's necessary that the sinner be fully aware. There is nothing unknown. There is no ignorance. They are fully aware that they are committing this sin on purpose. And in this case, like in the context, it would be those scribes and Pharisees inside. They absolutely, positively, and without it, they knew that that was God doing this stuff. 
And they said that it was Satan anyway. That's what this would have to look like. So they did it on purpose. Now, the language that's used here, it's, it's very strong. It's very forceful. And for me, you know, given, and I'm sure there are other options, but given these two options, it was hyperbole versus nope, it's really a hard line. I think that it would be wise for us to understand this in the more unrepentable sense. And even if I'm wrong, why would I do that? Well, it's safer. (laughs) That's all. It's simple. Now, here's the thing, though. Again, my opinion, if a person reached this point, like what we saw the Pharisees doing, and if they really, really knew that that was the spirit, but they called it something else anyway— If a person reaches this point, I mean, how could we even say that that person could or would ever again even be capable of repentance? I mean, they have really, man, they're out there. When you can look at God himself doing a work, if you will, and just call it Satan, that's kind of crazy and out there, right? So, I, again, I can't give you the, here's exactly what it means. But given those couple of choices, I, I think I think we need to look that, hey, this is truly an unpardonable sin. And we'll talk even more about that in a second. So th- this other thing, this he's saying that it's unforgivable in this age and in the age to come, which is, you know, it's a way of saying it's it's eternally unforgivable. So just for clarity, and I only say this because of some of the commentaries I read. Okay, this sin may only happen once. It only has to happen once. It's the guilt of this particular sin that goes on forever, that is unchanging. The state, uh, uh, the judgment cannot, will not be changed. Uh, It's just another way of saying there is no eternal life for this particular sinner. The only thing that awaits them is eternal death. So, again, I'm going to go back to it. And I think that a lot of people have this question, whether they listen to the podcast or not, I don't know. Should any of us be living in fear that, well, I don't know, I might have done this. I mean, it would have been an accident. I didn't mean to. But but is there now no hope for me? Well, I can't speak for God, but I am going to come down on the side of, no, I I really doubt it. And I would say there would have to be, and as I said before, it's, it's like a willful blindness, a willful stubbornness and obstinance, intention, malice. Now, we don't know, we can't know. Jesus may have seen into their hearts. Remember when it said, they said these things out loud, but then Jesus knowing their thoughts? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. We wondered what they might be thinking. Hey, maybe deep down, they knew that this was the work of God through the Spirit. But they said that stuff out loud anyway. Maybe that's why it says they said it out loud, but he knew their thoughts. I don't know, but... They wouldn't accept it. Uh, and we're, we're making an assumption here that they knew that they knew that they knew. There was no question, but they refused to accept it and they called it Satan anyway. Now, others, they even suggest this particular sin. They suggest it's not even possible for anyone to do it except for those people who were around when Jesus was walking on the earth and the spirit was working through him. And why was that special and important? Because that spirit was on him without measure. So you had Jesus, the actual incarnation of the word, and you had the Holy Spirit working through him, dwelling in him, resting on him without measure. And so because that was a super special case, then that was the only super special time that you could have uh, made this error. I don't know that I agree with it, but I'm just saying there are some people who think that. But all of this is to get to the point to harbor some doubt about 
certain popular movements. And, and if you've lived long enough, you've seen things going on in, within Christian, Christianity around the world. Maybe you've got some healing movement that's happening. Or maybe you've got some revivals that are going on. Or maybe certain individuals are becoming popular or famous because, you know, they're, who knows, whatever. They, they think they're a prophet from God or they think they're healing people or they're casting out demons or whatever. If you have doubts about that kind of stuff, okay, that's not the same thing that we're talking about at all. That is not knowing that God is doing a thing and purposely calling it Satan anyway. Having some skepticism, preferring to test things before you just accept them, that's just wisdom. It's okay. It's, it's in fact good. And, and being wrong about things. If I saw some guy and he's claiming that he's a prophet and I'm just going, you know, I just don't see it. I just don't think so. And, and it turns out that I'm wrong. This guy was totally a prophet from God. Okay. That's not an unrecoverable error. I'm, I'm doing my best with what I have, what I know. And, and to be fair, come on. Sometimes this stuff. It is fake. It's just humans being goofy. But every once in a while, well, I don't, you know what? Could it even be Satan? Samuel, do you think that it's ever possible that Satan is trying to fool people with some kinds of imitations or something? I mean, he's a, what does Peter say? He's a cunning lion waiting for someone to devour. Yeah. And, and and somewhere, I can't even remember where this occurs, says something about him trying to, to, to present himself as an angel of light, whatever. Okay, so maybe that's going on. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, maybe God has indeed, in some way, condescended to humanity, and he is, in fact, pouring out mercy. Maybe there really is healing going on. I don't know. Maybe there really is some sort of revival, whatever people, maybe it's, I don't know. But... We have the ability to discern, and we need to exercise it. And so, be a little skeptical, test things, whatever, and know that that's not bad. But don't be, don't be too harsh and too too like black and white, and and too quick to just say. Well, that's not God, so it must be Satan. Okay, you probably want to avoid that, but it's probably nothing that you should live in fear of. It's not like a bunch of people are walking around thinking they're Christians, but whoops, they messed up 20 years ago and they've never had a hope, so forget it, right? I just don't think that's the case. So anyway, there you go. Yeah, this is some tough stuff to navigate. Um, I, it's It's hard for me to walk away from this passage and... Um, not get the sense that maybe that Jesus is being very specific to the scribes and the Pharisees and how they're responding in this moment mm -hmm. uh, with saying that he's working through the power of Beelzebul to to cast out these demons and everything. Now, I'm not saying that what Jesus isn't saying here isn't some type of fundamental truth that could apply to life and people's walks and what they struggle with and in to, in today's age but it for me whenever we've gone through all this and all the things that you've brought to the table I'm getting the sense that Jesus is saying like to the scribes and Pharisees like guys you all are playing a very dangerous game right now like yeah. I have the ability to see inside your heart and I know that you're conflicted I, I know that truly it's almost impossible for you to deny that God is doing these things for good. And for some reason, I'm getting the sense that like maybe there's something going on with these scribes and Pharisees thinking, regardless of me accepting that the finger of God is at play here because this man, Jesus, is not the picture of who I thought Messiah would be and or who I want Messiah to be, like I refuse to accept it. I think that part of me thinks that that, that is at play too, that they're yeah. they're obstinate with Jesus coming as a humble 
suffering servant just is completely confounding them uh, to to get on board with. And so Jesus is being very specific here to that group. Um, now I, I'm open and flexible to to stand corrected and be wrong, but it I, I hope that that priority of looking at the context of this passage helps alleviate the theological weightiness that this passage gets treated with so often in the evangelical church. Yeah, and that's so great because it it also it's like this little side lesson for for humans. That thing that says look when you think you know something and you hold on to it uh, and I'm just going to use the word again irrationally. You, you know, I mean, I am all for knowing things. In fact, it's I, I do it to myself all the time. I push people all the time. Look, you got to know what you believe. You got to you got to know. But in that, you still have to remain open for oh wait, I'm wrong because we all are about a bunch of stuff all the time. We're just trying to put together the best picture that we can given what we've been given. And so it's just, it's another great example. You know, we can look at those scribes and Pharisees and we can, you know, have our our own opinion or judgment about them. But man, for us, this is so good. Just leave room for the things that you think you know that you, they just might not be true. So yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, and I I apologize. I know we're so so far past our <laughs> hour long <laughs> mark, but we're here and I, I I don't recall another time that Jesus is referencing this specific situation, so I'm just gonna ask it anyway so that we can clear it up. Um how and may, maybe Paul you can find a quick answer to this so we don't keep our listeners too much longer. How how does Jesus' example here with blasphemy against the Holy Spirit compare to like what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians? I think that's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, when he says, like, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How, how, are those similar, or is he talking about something completely different? Um, when you were going through that, that passage came to mind, and I'm just trying to get to the bottom of, like, is it the same thing or not? Yeah, well, for me, I think that the short answer is I'm going, I'm going to view those a little bit differently, because this is, it's uh, in the middle or at the end of Paul, he's he's trying to encourage his readers, listeners there in Ephesus on how they are to conduct themselves. And so, you know, he's he's talking about a bunch of things, you know, don't don't be angry, you know, don't be a thief, don't don't talk bad. He he's trying to to encourage them on proper and good behavior. And so that grieving of the Holy Spirit in that case, and this is again, it's just off the top of my head and short answer, I would say that grieving of the Holy Spirit is by you know the 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 point of the holy spirit the role of the holy spirit is to guide us into acting in god's will being in sync with god and so every time the spirit and let's just use you know common terms we might say the spirit is you know whispering some sort of instruction or guidance to you right in your inner man whenever that's going on and then you choose to ignore it or not act accordingly, that grieves the Spirit. And so, I, to me, that feels very different from, no, you've just attributed the Spirit to something else, and guess what? That is an offense. And it, it's not even an offense that the Spirit is taking on per se. It's presented as an offense that God is taking on for the Spirit and saying, uh, no, you can't cross that line and come back. Done. You're out of here. Gotcha. But that's me. So Paul's uh, instance here is not irrevocable in the sense that Jesus is using in the Gospels to say that, like, 
if in your life, in your journey, if you're struggling with something and you choose to elevate your own will above God's and that grieves the Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean that you're done for and all hope is lost. It's just, it's a characteristic that the Spirit displays in there, in in his interaction with people who are following God. Yes. What you okay. just said. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. All right, Samuel. This may be the record, yeah. but we're not going to worry about that. Uh, appreciate you guys all sticking around, and we're out of here. Okie dokie. Oh! Outro super short. Don't forget to leave a rating and a review for our podcast. Check us out on our website at www.okidokimos.com. Send us your questions or comments at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.